Yeah, so we will uh, just uh, I'll uh, submit. Please, can you unshare your screen? Then uh, Professor Das will yeah. share his screen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Just a minute. Yes, sir. You can you can share his so screen. So let me share. It. Just uh, seeing all the options. Share your computer audio. Share. Uh, you can see the screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can see. Okay. Screen. Let me go to the uh, full. Okay. Let me go to that slide first. I think this one. Let me try to play this. Uh, just tell me, you know, whether you can hear this audio or not. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry. It is pretty well known that animals can actually rely on their sensory skills in order to locate prey, uh, find their yes, prey. Can you hear? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Clearly, perfect. clearly, sir. Okay, perfect, perfect. I just wanted to check. And so, with your okay. permission, can we can we record this meeting for the? Uh, you can record this meeting. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. okay so yeah. so, we will so then start I will share it once. Yes, sure. yes, sir. Sure, sure. Sure. Once the uh, yeah. uh, chair will introduce you and then I will, uh, you will start uh, the presentation at the 9.30. So, sure. No problem. Yes, yeah. Thank you so much, sir.
good morning everyone good morning all the participants and good evening to you sir uh, uh, participants uh, i would like to welcome you all on behalf of ieee ntc student chapter at indian institute of technology indore today's webinar is on the smart sensors and computing devices for hardware artificial intelligence our speaker dr saptarishi das is a material is from material research institute pennsylvania state university usa so before going forward with the today's webinar talk i would like to introduce our speaker with you all dr das is an associate professor of engineering in science and mechanics esm from material science and engineering electrical engineering and computer sciences he is also member of material research institute mri at penn state university dr saptarishi das has received his b engineering degree in 2007 in electronics and telecommunication engineering from jadavpur university and phd degree in 2009 in 2013 in electrical and computer engineering from purdue university before joining penn state he was a post doctoral research scholar from 2013 to 15 and assistant research scientist from 2015 to 16 at argonne national laboratory nl dr das is a recipient of young investigator award from united state air force office of scientific research in 2017 and national science foundation nsf career award in 2021 dr das research group at penn state leads a new multidisciplinary area of science namely biometric sensing and neuromorphic computing based on novel materials and devices inspired by various animal brains that allow evolutionary success of the species participants before going forward with the talk i would like you all to keep uh, your audio in the mute condition and meanwhile if you have any question you can write in the chat box or at the end of the talk we will give you sufficient time to directly ask with our speaker sir now the floor is all yours uh, okay let me go ahead and uh, start uh, sharing okay let me go to the full screen mode you can see it now yes sir uh, we can see it okay perfect so uh, thanks uh, sanjay for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for this uh, webinar Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, smart sensor and computing devices for hardware artificial intelligence. Before I do so, uh, let me just give you uh, a little bit background uh, about myself. Um, I started uh, schooling in uh, Kolkata in Hare School. Uh, then I moved on to do my uh, uh, bachelor's uh, in electronics and telecommunication engineering from Jadavpur University. Uh, after that, I pursued my PhD degree uh, from Purdue University. electrical and computer engineering department uh, in micro and nano electronics uh, beyond that uh, i was uh, an assistant scientist and a postdoctoral research scholar at the argonne national laboratory which is a department of energy uh, lab uh, in the united states uh, and uh, after that i joined uh, penn state uh, uh, and currently uh, engineering science and mechanics is my home department but i'm also affiliated with electrical and computer science department material science and engineering department as well as the material research institute this is our department and this is where we do our all research this is millennium science building uh and this is a little bit about penn state uh, nitni line is kind of our mascot uh, penn state is pretty well known for its football uh, we just had some wonderful fall colors and uh, the days for winter are approaching so we'll be soon uh, in this condition uh 
I'd also like to acknowledge uh, all the funding agencies uh, uh, without uh, whose uh, support we can't do any research. Uh, so I received the NSF uh, Early Career Award uh, earlier this year. Uh, I also received the Young Investigator Award from AFSR in uh, 2017. Uh, apart from that, our research is funded by United States Army, uh, Navy, uh, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, uh, as well as uh, various uh, private organizations and uh, uh, philanthropic organizations. So, I'd also like to acknowledge my uh, group members uh, because uh, they are the uh, uh, person who actually do the research on ground. Uh, so I'm thankful for uh, to them in order to carry out uh, all this wonderful research uh, that we are uh, uh, trying to do in my lab. So with that, I would like to start uh, the uh, the core of my talk, uh, and I think uh, we are going to talk about the neuromorphic uh, and biomimetic devices. Uh, and uh, first, I would like to articulate uh, why are we working on these areas. Uh, we all know that uh, there is a technological revolution that has been happening for the last uh, six decades. Uh, uh, in fact, the computers have become so powerful uh, that today they can really compete uh, with the power of a human brain. Uh, if we continue at this pace, uh, then by the year 2030 uh, or even sooner, uh, the computers will be as powerful as all human brains on this planet combined. Um, now, if you think about the supercomputers, the supercomputers that are actually pretty huge, uh, they occupy size, which is very similar to a football field. And then they consume a huge amount of power, uh, close to 10 megawatt. Uh, but if we compare that with the human brain, then you will see that the human brain is actually energy as well as area efficient by orders of magnitude. I mean, to be precise, it's like six orders of magnitude energy and area efficient compared to the supercomputers for performing uh, similar tasks uh, that uh, the current AI or the neuromorphic systems can do. One of the main reason uh, that uh, these uh, energy bottleneck exist is because of the architecture of the uh, uh, present day computers, which is von Neumann computing, where the uh, logic or the unit where you do all the arithmetic operation is separate from the memory unit where you store all the information or the data. Given that we are living in the era of big data, we have a huge amount of data that must be processed uh, and Every time you want to process the data, you have to essentially shuttle the data from memory to the logic and again back into the memory. And that consumes a huge amount of energy than your actual arithmetic operation. So that is the bottleneck of the von Neumann computing. In contrast, the brain is actually non-von Neumann because the computing units, which are these neurons, are actually right next to the synapses, which are simply the connection between two consecutive neurons. In an adult brain, you can find close to 100 billion neurons, and each neuron on average is connected to 1,000 other neurons through this synapses. So there are almost 100 trillion synapses or memory units in a human brain, uh, and there are close to 100 billion neurons. So if you compare that uh, with uh, your simple uh, uh, three centimeter by three centimeter Intel chip, it has a billion transistor, close to a billion transistor, right? So therefore, brain is massively parallel uh, and on the top of that, the memory and logic are right next to each other. Therefore, it works on the principle of non von Neumann computing. Therefore, if you really want to bridge the gap between the computing power of the brain in terms of energy and area efficiency, we really need to start thinking about innovations. And the innovations have to start all the way from materials. Using these novel materials, we have to build innovative devices and using those devices, we have to essentially redesign our circuits and architecture in order to bridge this gap between artificial and natural intelligence. So, now, I would also like to emphasize that the AI that you see today, uh, most of the neural networks, you know, you have heard about artificial neural network, uh, and there are different incarnations of that, like convolution neural network, uh, uh, deep neural network, uh, probabilistic neural network, spiking neural network. They are mostly influenced by this uh, simple architecture of the brain, where we talk about, you know, neurons connected to other neurons through synapses. However, there is more to the brain than just simple connections. And in fact, that becomes even more evident when we look beyond the human brain and start looking into different animal brains. So, uh, the reason for that is human brain is very good when it comes to cognitive computing, but when it comes to sensory computing, animals actually supersede humans. So, 
And if you think about the Internet of Things sensors, we are simply going to deploy all these devices which are going to collect information. And information collection is nothing but essentially sensory transduction. You are going to, uh, and that is exactly what we humans or any animal do. We collect sensory information through our sensory organs, which are then processed by the brain, and we kind of get our intelligence out of that. But if you think about the animals, they can do something which the human brains cannot do. For example, uh, the spiders uh, can actually uh, see polarized light. The uh, uh, sorry, the octopuses can see the polarized light, and the spiders can actually feel micro vibrations. The African bush elephants can smell water from a long distance. Uh, catfish is an amazing sense of test, and the barn owl can hunt in complete darkness. In fact. The sensory skills of the animals go beyond what the capability of human beings are. For example, jewel beetles can sense Earth's infrared radiation, and bees can sense Earth's magnetic field. And typically, what have been conceived is that the animals, you know, survive in resource-constrained environment, and they have very, very tiny brain, which means that they have very limited neural resources, and yet they are evolutionarily successful. So therefore, there, there has to be some kind of intelligence that plays out in their sensory organ that allows them to succeed in their evolutionary success. And that is exactly what we are trying to essentially mimic in our group. We are trying to get influenced by the animal brains and design new types of devices which can actually give us the energy and area efficient smart sensors. So here I'm going to play a quick video of the overall philosophy that we follow in our group. It is pretty well known that animals can actually rely on their sensory skills in order to locate prey, uh, find their predators, and even find their mates, uh, which ultimately determines their evolutionary success. Now, what is very fascinating and sometimes very humbling to us is that they do it with minimum amount of resources. They consume very little amount of energy, and their tiny brains can perform computational tasks, uh, which are essentially very difficult even for the modern day computers. We we are trying to mimic their uh, functionality into our devices and just learning about biology, how, how uh, animals around us behave is very interesting for me. Nature is not only beautiful but also it is very smart and this is very deep rooted in everyone who's working in this group. Uh, we're doing something brand new. Uh, we're connecting nature and technology in a way that no one else quite has before. So the primary focus of our research is to develop an unified platform for the next generations of ultra low power and artificially intelligent sensors, which can not only sense the data from the environment, but can also process that information. It can actually store that information. And at the end of the day, it can also communicate that information among each other without compromising the security of the information. So whether we're trying to sense a virus, sense an earthquake, sense changes in the climate or critical risks that we face, Having better sensors means better information, and better information means better outcomes. These new sensors that we are developing in this era of Internet of Things is that there is so many of them. In fact, there will be almost like close to a trillion sensors by the year 2030. Uh, and each of them are going to consume energy. And the total energy consumption is going to reach almost 20% of the total energy expenditure that the human population uses. And unless and until we essentially solve this problem and make these uh, sensors energy efficient, we will not be able uh, to cope with these energy challenges. Really, if you want to move towards a sustainable future, we need to make sure that we make these sensors as energy efficient as possible. Uh, thank you for listening to the video. So let now uh, let me now introduce you know uh, one by one uh, all the way from the innovation at the materials level uh, to the device circuit and architectural level that we are working uh, in order to essentially accomplish our goal of mimicking biology. Uh, we work with two dimensional materials and many of you may have heard about graphene. Uh, it's an excellent uh, conductor. Uh, in fact, Nobel Prize in Physics was given for uh, this particular material in 2005. Uh, but graphene is really not a semiconductor, and that is something which is very important for us who are working uh, in the field of uh, nanoelectronics. Uh, there is another 2D material called hexagonal boron nitride. It's actually an insulator, and that actually shows you that uh, what the capability we can achieve at a low dimensional level. Uh, and the reason for that is even if you simply replace the carbon atom by boron and nitrogen, the property of the material changes from being conductor to insulator, right? And, and that's a massive change. 
and this continues you can also have semiconductors uh, uh, for example transition metal dichalcogenides are semiconducting materials and uh, these transition metal dichalcogenides are actually uh, uh, these uh, materials with the formula of MX2, where M is the transition metal. There is a huge list of transition metal in the periodic table. And then there are, there are chalcogens like sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. If we just combine these materials, then you can get a huge variety of this system. And in that, you can get metal, semiconductors, insulators, and even superconductors. So, so this is a fascinating class of materials which can be available uh in in natural mines and you can actually create uh, uh, really very very small layers out of this material because these materials are van der waals materials which means that in plane uh, the atoms are actually strongly bonded but out of plane there is no bonding and they are hold together in this crystal by van der waals force and that's why they are called van der waals materials and that allows you to really peel off layer by layer these materials and achieve very very thin layers down to one single layer and that is actually key towards you know new properties that emanate uh, from these materials as well as we all know that the silicon is kind of aging and one of the problem with silicon is that you cannot really make silicon very very thin because if you make it very very thin then all detrimental quantum effects will come in and that essentially will make your devices really very bad. I'm not going into the details of that. I think if you're interested, I can talk about it later. Uh, and the problem is silicon cannot be made very thin. In fact, the current silicon pin fit technology that the Intel or TSMC uses uh, have a six nanometer uh, body thickness of the silicon. However, these two dimensional materials can be 10 times thinner, uh, 0.65 nanometer. Uh, and that allows you to essentially scale this material much more aggressively compared to silicon. And this is exactly why we are looking into this material as a replacement for silicon or augmenting silicon devices in the future technology nodes. Uh, we do really fabricate these devices. So, so we are primarily an experimental group. Uh, so we uh, go into the lab, exfoliate these materials, you know, do e-beam lithography, put contacts and make field effect transistors. So, uh, and you can clearly see over here, uh, molybdenum sulfide, molybdenum selenide, telluride, tungsten sulfide, tungsten selenide are all semiconducting material. And they show us very nice uh, 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 FET characteristics with large on-off ratio, reasonable mobility numbers, large on currents, uh, so which shows that these materials are really very promising. Now, these particular experiments were done using exfoliated material, uh, but really, if you re want to make a technology out of these materials, we have to grow them over a large area. We have to be able to manufacture them, and that is something uh, uh, we do uh, in collaboration with our wonderful colleagues uh, from Penn State who grow these materials on different kinds of substrate at different temperatures uh, uh, using different techniques. And then they hand over these wafers to us. We transfer them onto our desired substrate. And then we go ahead with different types of characterization, starting from atomic force microscopy, uh, XPS, uh, uh, you know, Raman and photoluminescence. Uh, and then finally, we make our devices. So, uh, once we make our devices, we don't remain at a single device level. We also fabricate integrated circuits. So here you can see uh, there is not only one device, but there are like uh, hundreds and even thousands of devices. Uh, and we make this kind of integrated circuits or chips, uh, which are completely made out of this 2D material. So we are essentially trying to uh, take these new materials uh, and make it technologically ready. Uh, you have heard about the technology readiness level or TRL level. So we are trying to essentially accelerate uh, from TRL level three, which is in academia to TRL level four or five before the industry actually takes, uh, 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 takes it up, up and then uh, uh, try to put it into their production. We do a lot of benchmarking of these materials. Benchmarking is a critical word that you may have heard in engineering uh, that uh, uh, for uh, devices to work, you cannot really uh, show your champion device, but you really have to show that all your devices or most of your devices work. So yield is a very important criteria. And that is what we also do in our lab. Uh, we essentially measure uh, hundreds and even thousands of these devices and look into uh, their properties in terms of you know threshold voltage, uh, the interface trap, uh, uh, the on-off ratio, uh, mobility, which are all critical parameters for field effect transistors. Uh, uh, 
uh, and also the contact resistance because one of the uh, critic of the 2D material is that the contact resistance can really be detrimental for its performance. And we have been able to do uh, different tricks in order to improve the contact resistance and make sure the device performs as well or as good as the current silicon-based FinTech technology. Uh, uh, as I have mentioned that, uh, you know, we have to uh, really uh, go and replace silicon. Uh, and in silicon, we know that there is a complementary nature. We have both N-type FETs and P-type FETs. Uh, the good part is that these 2D materials allows us to essentially achieve the same goal. Uh, if we take monolayer MOS2, that's typically an N-type device. But however, if you take vanadium doped WAC2, tungsten selenide, it's a P-type device. Uh, so we have both NMOS and PMOS, and therefore we could create this 2D complementary metal oxide semiconductor technology using these 2D material. Uh, and that is very important for digital and analog devices that we are going to build later. The other thing I mentioned is that for silicon CMOS, the logic and memory are separate. So your storage is different from your computation. Uh, but that we cannot do uh, because in brain, the synapses and neurons are right next to each other. So we also have to bring them closer. And that is exactly what we do by creating a particular back gate stack, which is programmable, which is very similar to your field programmable gate array. So here you can apply a certain voltage in order to inject charge into this oxide. And that changes the threshold voltage of the transistor. And you can also uh, perform an erase operation where you remove those charges from the gate oxide and that uh, essentially brings back the threshold voltage. So here, what I'm showing is that by applying some negative voltages to the transistor, you can really program the device from a low conductance state, which is this uh, uh, pink curve, uh, to this blue curve, which is the high conductance state. Uh, similarly, if I apply positive voltages, then I can take my device from a high conductance state to the low conductance state. And this is nothing but storing different weights in your neural network. You have heard about artificial neural network where you have different weights, and then these weights essentially are multiplied and added, uh, and then they are essentially applied to some uh, activation function. So here, these devices are acting as synapses because they can actually store different weights, which is nothing but the conductance value. Okay? Uh, and once you store that weights, that those have to be non-volatile, uh, and here we are showing that uh, we can essentially program our device to different conductance states. These are the conductance values, and we can retain those states over a significant amount of time, which is required for artificial neural networks. So, and we can do it for both the N-type FET, uh, which is MOS2, as well as for the P-type vanadium doped WAC2. So both our NMOS and PMOS are programmable. Therefore, our CMOS platform is programmable which means that we have essentially crossed over this hurdle of non von Neumann computing. What is the advantage? The advantage now is that I can create an inverter, which is a basic primitive for digital computing uh, uh, over here. Uh, I could also create neuromorphic primitives. Let's say, for example, a sigmoid activation function uh, and a Gaussian neuron. So my device itself could act as a neuron, but at the same time, since I can program them, it can also store weights. And because it can store weights, you can have inverter with different inverting thresholds or a sigmoid with different activation function or a Gaussian with different amplitude, mean, and standard deviation. So the device itself acts like a neuron as well as a synapse. It's a neurosynaptic device which accomplishes uh, this idea of non von Neumann computing. Now, there is another unique advantage of our 2D material. Uh, and that is the part that it also is active to light. Uh, so earlier we were talking about machine learning, where we essentially you know, store weights and do some inference. Uh, we uh, update those weights. Now we can also combine you know, uh, optical response or machine vision with machine learning, because machine vision is nothing but uh, taking into account that I can re really read images. And therefore, you have to have a device which is photoactive. Uh, the monolayer MOS2 has this unique property that when you shine light on it, the device characteristics changes uh, because uh, it is photoresponsive. Now, it has another important aspect is that uh, when you illuminate this particular material with light, uh, what happens is you generate this electron hole pairs, and some of these holes are actually captured in the 
uh, alumina layer. And once you capture these holes, that acts like a fixed charge and changes the threshold voltage of the device. Now, depending upon where are you illuminating this particular device, you may be able to store that information over here or may not store that information. For example, if we illuminate the device in the on state, you can see that after the illumination, if I measure the device, there is no change in the device characteristics. But if the device is illuminated in the off state, uh, then I actually enable a locked up trap states over here, which can capture those holes. And that leads to a change in the threshold voltage of the device. So now my device actually remembers what it has seen. And that is going to be very important for the machine vision application. So, so we can essentially perform direct learning. Uh, so my device sees an image and through a reinforcement kind of learning, my device actually learns what it sees. And that is typically not the case for most of the vision sensors out there today. When you take a picture using your camera, uh, you have an SD card stored into your camera to actually capture and store that image. So your lenses are capturing the information, but it is actually being stored in an SD card. Now, what we are able to do is that we are able to store the information in the sensor itself without transferring it to a different storage unit. So that is the essential advantage. And once we store that information, it is essentially retained like your SD card in your camera. So we are eliminating the requirement for your SD card for a, uh, a artificial intelligence or neuromorphic application. It simply makes sense because we are trying to combine the machine vision with machine learning because most of the information that these autonomous vehicles, drones or robots are going to acquire are actually optical or visual information. So here is an example of using an array of device to learn this input information, which is this image of the letter T. Uh, as uh, I keep showing that particular image to the array of my device, the device simply learns that information T. Now, another important aspect, which I will not go into the detail, is that we can actually learn things in an adaptive manner. What does adaptive learning mean? Uh, you can kind of think about the uh, your own eyes or, or human eyes. Uh, we can actually see things uh, properly in bright daylight, uh, for sure, but we can also see things uh, when it is dark. So our eyes can actually adapt to the ambient environment. Uh, and that is because in our eyes, we have two types of cells. One are called the rot cells, and the other ones are the cones. Cones are actually good in uh, uh, bright light, and the rods are good in the uh, dark light condition. So we can also essentially do the same using our device. Uh, where we actually try to learn the image of a T, which is not so bright. You see the contrast is very poor, but we can still learn that T uh, very prominently by really biasing the device in different conditions. So by really programming the device into different condition, I could essentially mimic my device to become a rod cell or a con cell. And that actually relates to the adaptive learning part. Now, another important aspect in our, uh, uh, you know, in, in memory or primates memory is that uh, uh, forgetting. So forgetting also plays an important role in learning because until and unless you forget information, your neurons are not going to be freed in order to store new information, right? Now, in human brain, uh, really, you have no control over how soon or how fast you can forget things, right? That we do not have a control over. But here in this particular device, I can actually use my programming to forget either immediately the learned information or forget it over a period of time. And that's going to become actually very important in terms of different uh, scenarios. If I really want to retain and learn information forever, I will actually disable the forgetting part, uh, which is not true for the humans. You have no control over your forgetting. While if I do not want to retain information, which is unnecessarily, I can immediately forget it. Again, that control you do not have over your brain. Uh, the advantage of that is that, you know, let's say, for example, I could perform some kind of an unsupervised learning. Uh, so here I'm trying to learn this letter L. And then you will see uh, at some point of time, this letter L will change to letter T. So a new information come. Now, typically, if I do not tell my sensor what to do, uh, it will not learn this new information. But with the help of this forgetting, if I enable that in my device, it can automatically learn a new information. So here you will see that the sensor learns the letter L. But then once the information of T changes, if I do not have forgetting, which are these cases, 
you can kind of see that the new information is not learned. In fact, it is overlapped with the previous learned information and everything is kind of messed up. But if the forgetting is present, then I can essentially over the time learn new information and forget the old information. So it kind of forms a little bit of unsupervised learning, uh, which is very difficult to achieve in hardware nowadays because most of the learning part is done in software. Now with these capabilities, you know, what I have told so far is that in our devices, we have been able to combine uh, sensing, storage and compute all together. And now I'm going to show you a real life example of where it can be used. Uh, and here is uh, what we have done is for a biomimetic technology for collision avoidance. And collision avoidance is something very important for both robotics as well as autonomous vehicles and drones, right? When these drones are moving around or your autonomous cars are moving around, they have to avoid collision. Now it is very important uh, or interesting that we draw our inspiration from an insect, an anthropod. Uh, it's a locust, uh, and you may have heard about locusts. They actually move in swamps. Uh, they are pretty notorious and uh, not really well known uh, uh, for the devastation that they create in their agricultural fields. But there's a unique aspect about this insect vision. You know, this locust uh, or the swarms of locust, you know, consist of almost a million of locusts, and they fly all together. Uh, they occupy a very small area, a square mile uh, uh, or so. Uh, but they never collide with each other. Uh, more interestingly, this collision avoidance uh, in the locust is taken care of by a single neuron, which is called this lobular giant movement detector neuron or LGMD neuron. Now, since it can detect, uh, avoid collision using a single neuron, it is extremely energy efficient, as well as it is also very area efficient. Therefore, its tiny brain can process a very difficult computational task seamlessly. The way it does that is that when an object approaches the eye of the locust, there are two information. One is the angular projection theta, which increases as the object comes closer. And the other one is the angular velocity, which also increases with time. Now, the neural network inside the brain of the locust has two pathways. One is the forward pathway. So it takes the angular velocity and creates an excitatory response in this blue branch, uh, dendritic branch of the neuron while at the same time it takes the angular projection ang or theta and creates a inhibitory response using a feed uh, in using a lateral inhibition in this red branch of branch of the near dendritic cell and then what it does it it kind of multiplies the two so you have one increasing and the other one decreasing and that creates a non monotonic escape response where the firing frequency actually becomes highest before the actual collision is going to take place. So then the LGMD neuron notifies this DCMD neuron, which then tells the motor neurons to uh, change the uh, direction of motion of the locust and the locust avoids the collision. Now, earlier, you know, insect visions have been uh, realized using uh, FPGA chips, uh, but they have used like 34 transistors, five capacitors and really occupied a pretty big area. But given that the capabilities that we have in our 2D material system, that is sensing, compute, and storage, we can accomplish this task using a single device, like a single neuron in the locust. Uh, so we use the monolayer MOS2 and a looming object to create an excitatory photoresponse in the device, as I have already showed that the MOS2 is photoresponsive. And at the same time, we use the non-volatile programmability of uh, the back gate or the gate oxide uh, in order to create an inhibitory response. And here is an example uh, experimental demonstration. So we have a toy car, uh, which is mounted with a LED, uh, and it is on a collision course with this sensor. Now, first, we kind of try to figure out what is the experience of the sensor when an object is on a collision course. And you can see that the intensity of the light that the sensor sees increases in a non -monoton in a monotonic fashion. Now, this is what is going to happen if two cars on a collision course, and if they're far apart, then of course the amount of light that the sensor sees is very small. And as the two cars approaches, the intensity of light simply keeps increasing. Now, what happens if we subject our device to a similar kind of a stimulus where the light is increasing over time? And you can see that the photo current in the device increases. Now, interestingly, depending upon the speed of the approaching object, 
the response actually changes. And you can see a fast, a faster moving object creates an earlier response and a slow moving object creates a response which is later. But this response alone is not sufficient for me to detect the collision because I do not know when is the collision going to happen. Now, in order to do that, we take advantage of this programmability of our device where we show that by applying programming pulses, we can actually decrease the current in the device over time as the programming pulses are applied. Now, what happens if both stimulus are present at the same time, which means that the light is being shined at the same time the device is being programmed. Then you can see that the current through the device follows a non-monotonic trend. And there is a turnover point when the current stops decreasing and starts to increase. And this is very similar to the escape response of the uh, LGMD neuron. And you can see that the collision can be then detected at this minima point where the collision point is over here. So the collision detection is uh, preceding the collision point. And no matter at what speed the object is approaching, uh, and no matter, you know, the different biasing condition of the device can be actually tuned to show that the time to collision is always higher than the time to detection, which means that I am successfully detecting the collision. What is even more interesting is that the amount of energy consumed for this task could be as low as a few nanojoules. So, so this is extremely energy efficient way of performing a difficult computational task by combining the sensing, compute and storage capability of our new 2D material based devices. This work, if you are more interested, you can go and read in the Nature Electronics article, which was published last year. Um, I will give you another example. Uh, and that is to do with navigation, because our autonomous vehicle not only needs to collide, uh, not only needs to avoid collision, but they also need to be able to navigate. Uh, when it comes to navigation, we may want to learn something from Barn Owl. Uh, what is very interesting about Barn Owl is that it really doesn't use its eyes to find anything. It actually uses its ears uh, or sound to locate the pace. Um, in fact, it has a sound localization capability with a precision of one to three degrees. We humans have a precision of 20 to 40 degrees. We are actually very bad in finding out which direction precisely the sound is coming from. Now, sound localization is another very difficult computational task. Uh, and the way it is solved is by having two ears on two sides of the body. And this solve problem is uh, particularly solved by all mammals, you know, all avians and uh, most of the uh, uh, primates. Uh, but the barn owl does it especially well. And that's why I'm taking the example of the barn owl because it has the highest precision. Now, uh, when sound wave comes from a particular direction, you can see that the time it takes to reach the right ear is different from the time it takes to reach the left ear because there's a path difference and sound has a finite velocity, and therefore this path difference leads to a time difference. Um, now, depending upon the head size of the object, this time difference could be very different. So elephants have big head, so the time difference will be much larger uh, compared to human, and the barn owl will actually have a very, very small time difference, which is in the ranges of hundreds of microseconds. Now, the problem is, uh, in the brain, the neurons can fire only once in few milliseconds. So you are trying to solve a problem which exists in a microsecond time scale using computational tools which can only operate in every few milliseconds. So that's a difficult computational task. Now the way it is solved is by converting this temporal map into a spatial coding. And the way to do that is to create these two types of neurons. One is called the coincidence neuron which detects the information when it arrives at these two uh, points at the same time. As you can see from the name of the neuron, it is a coincidence neuron. When information arrives at the same time, this particular neurons fire. And then there are these delay neurons. And these neurons are coming from the two sides of the brain, uh, essentially from the two ears, uh, the left ear and the right ear. Now, let me show you what is really going to happen. So here is an example. Uh, where uh, you have a sound source, if the sound comes straight ahead, then it reaches both ears at the same time, and the coincidence happens in the middle. But if the sound comes from something, let's say, at the left, then it reaches the left ear first, 
and the right year later. So the coincidence is going to happen at a different spot. So depending upon where did the coincidence took place, right? The barn owl can figure out which direction the sound came from, right? If the coincidence is at the middle, it came from uh, straight ahead. If the coincidence happened over here, then it came from the left. If it comes from the right, then the coincidence will happen over there. And it can be very precise depending upon how many coincidence neuron it has got. So we try to mimic that in our solid state device. So here I'm showing the similar kind of an architecture. These are all the delay neurons. And then uh, if you zoom in, you will find that these are all our coincidence neuron. These are simply split gated field effect transistors with different spacing between the split gates. Uh, so these are simple normal transistors, but instead of having a continuous gate, I have split it into two. So there's a top gate, there's a bottom gate, and the spacing between the two gates is actually changing uh, from 200, 300, 400, 500 to 600 nanometer. Now, interestingly, what happens is that when the information comes uh, and it meets at these two top and bottom neurons at the same time, then only the device actually starts uh, uh, shutting down or stops conduction. So the conduction change happen when the information is actually uh, uh, appears on these two gates at the same time. Okay, so that's how we can determine the coincidence. Now, where the coincidence took place could be determined by the magnitude of the current. So you can see that the magnitude of the current from the blue to yellow to green actually changes. So here I could say by just looking or measuring the current at the output of the device and looking into the current that a coincidence has taken place, whether at the green or the yellow or the, uh, the orange neuron. Uh, so this is a very similar map, but the interesting part is we are actually doing two types of computation in the device. In the vertical direction, which is the coincidence direction, it's actually a digital computation. This is nothing but a NAND gate. But in the horizontal direction, we are doing an analog computation. And that is something that is not typically done because your most of your current day chips are either digital chips or analog chips. Here we are essentially trying to combine both aspects and taking advantage of each to design more, more biomimetic smart sensors. Now, if you can ask, you know, okay, that's all good, but uh, what advantage do we have? The advantage is that we can use our nanotechnology, we can create really, really tiny devices, and we can actually become better than the barn owl. Because for the barn owl, you know, once its uh, uh, predatory requirements have been satisfied, it has got enough food to eat, it is happy. But human beings are never happy, right? We are very greedy about technology. We always want to essentially, you know, kind of advance our technology. And therefore, by learning from nature and by using our nanotechnology, we can actually get better precision than the barn owl. And that could help us in designing our next generation of navigational sensors, again, for autonomous vehicles or drones or robots. Um, and then I would like to give you a third example. Uh, and the third example is, again, uh, will also be a little bit contrary to what you have believed so far, uh, is called the stochastic resonance or noise enhanced detection of the signal, or you know how noise can be used for better computation. Uh, typically, if you are from electrical engineering or for that matter, any engineering background, uh, you will say that noise is always a nuisance. You always want to get rid of the noise because uh, uh, you have to increase the signal to noise ratio. So either increase the signal strength or you reduce the noise flow. Uh, and that's how you can essentially discover a signal, right? And you can really do it by using different types of instrument like locking amplifier, low noise amplifier, noise filters. But the problem is they're very hardware expensive, bulky and energy inefficient. So they're not really appropriate for IoT sensors which are going to be deployed in remote and inaccessible locations, right? Uh, but interestingly, uh, many animals uh, actually survive in resource constrained environment by exploiting noise. So here I'm going to give you an example whether nature thinks that noise is a nuisance or not. So this is a paddlefish and the paddlefish can be found in Mississippi River in the US or in Yangtze River in China. Uh, and uh, this particular paddlefish uh, uh, survives uh, by feeding on the zooplankton called daphnia. Uh, now, these uh, rivers where these paddlefish can be found are actually very muddy. Uh, so you can't really see anything once you are inside the uh, water. Uh, so the way the paddlefish finds this daphnia is by the fact that daphnia, when it moves, it creates very, very tiny electrical signal. 
uh, which has an amplitude of tens of microvolt. So over the course of evolution, the paddle fish has developed this particular organ called rostrum, uh, which is an electroreceptor. So it can really detect very tiny electrical signal. So now, uh, back in 1999, this group actually performed a behavioral experiment where they said that, okay, I have this signal from Daphnia, which is very, very tiny. Let's add a little bit of electrical noise to that signal and let's see what the paddle fish does. And the results were actually quite interesting. So they found uh, that if the Daphnia, if, if they don't add any noise, then the paddle fish is able to find the Daphnia until a distance of, let's say, 50 meters. If they add too much amount of noise, then the paddle fish is completely lost uh, because everything is noisy. But with the right amount of noise, the paddle fish is able to find Daphnia even at 70 meter distance, which means that its range of detection got increased when there's a little bit of noise, a right amount of noise added to the signal of the Daphnia. Now, in a behavioral experiment in a lab, you can add noise. The question is, where does this noise come in nature? And then they found that this noise is created by the army of Daphnia. So therefore, the noise created by this army is creating problem for this outpost Daphnia and making the life of this Daphnia miserable because the paddle fish can now more easily find it and feed on it. Now, the examples of uh, stochastic, and this is called stochastic resonance, and the stochastic resonance examples are found in sensory neurobiology, uh, in multiple, uh, you know, uh, examples of uh, finding prey or escaping from predators or finding mates. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, it is found even in the explanation of periodic reoccurrence of Earth's ice ages uh, and even opening and closing of iron challenge. So, stochastic resonance in nature is at every scale, from geographical uh, to uh, biological. Uh, no, so what is stochastic resonance? The concept is actually very simple. If you have a signal which is below the range of detection of your sent sensor, you wouldn't be able to detect that signal. But if you add a little bit of white noise, then periodically the signal will cross the detection threshold. And if you have a sensing device, then it can amplify that uh, information and the signal gets detected. Uh, because white noise has got all types of frequencies, while the signal has a certain frequency, when the resonance occurs, you get the detection and that's why it is called stochastic resonance. So, now we thought, okay, can we use this principle in order to enhance the vision or photo detection capability of our MOS2 based devices? So we did the same experiment. We used some periodic signal on the LED and we found that when the LED becomes actually very, very dim, uh, then the uh, sensor cannot uh, detect the signal um, anymore. Uh, here is an example. Uh, so for example, we have a very, very uh, dim LED, you know, which is uh, growing over here, which is a periodic signal. Uh, there is nothing getting detected by our MOS2 photo detector as expected because the signal is too weak and below the detection limit of the sensor. Uh, then we just did some noise, you know, if simply we have noise, then also there is no detection because there is no signal, right? There is simply noise. So the signal by itself or noise cannot be detected. Uh, but then we did a third experiment where we actually combine the two. So we have the weak signal and then we add a little bit of noise to that. And then we found that the signal can be detected uh, uh, by adding noise. And this is essentially an experimental demonstration of uh, stochastic resonance in solid state device. We have seen it in sensory neurobiology, but this is for the first time it was demonstrated in a solid state device. So the idea is that if you add a little bit of amount of noise, uh, then the signal starts to cross the threshold uh, and it starts to get detected. But if you add too much amount of noise, then everything gets uh, really lost uh, in the noise. Um, uh, this is a typical curve of the signal to noise ratio as a function of noise intensity. And you can see that too little of noise, nothing gets detected, too much of noise, everything gets messed up. If you have right amount of noise, then the signal is detected. And the amount of energy that you are spending for the detection of the signal is actually very minuscule and it's the order of tens of nanojoule. The idea of SR can be extended to uh, other types of sensors uh, beyond photo detection to chemical, biological, thermal, as well as radiation. Uh, and that kind of brings me to the uh, summary of my talk. Uh, I think we have uh, multiple different papers. Uh, we, I couldn't go into all of them, but I think the overall uh, uh, philosophy of our research group is that we are trying to exploit unique physical properties of 2D materials to develop new computing and sensing devices, drawing inspiration from 
the information processing inside animal brains to bridge the energy gap between the artificial and natural intelligence. So if you are interested, you can go and read all these papers. Uh, uh, we have many more. Uh, and if you have any questions, then I will be uh, happy to take those. I think we still have 10 minutes uh, uh, to uh, address some of your questions. Thank you. Participant, participant, door is open for the question. Please ask question directly with our speaker. Uh, hi, Saptashi. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, uh, this is Jishnu here. I have a question. Uh, most of the paper you have, uh, you and your group have used the moly disulfide as a base material. And the mechanism is more of them are like trapping and detrapping of the charge when we you try to uh, calibrate the conduction level and make the uh, hysteresis loop you, you use the mechanism on trapping and detrapping so is there any uh, performance degradation or uh, that kind of a thing in presence of water vapor like yeah, I think MDM. that's an excellent question. I think that's an excellent question, Jishnu. I think uh, uh, one of the uh, main challenge that we typically face uh, is the fact that uh, because it is trapping and detrapping, uh, there's a little bit of stochasticity in that process. Um, and it is very difficult to always control. And as you mentioned, that if I make my measurements in air versus in vacuum, the presence of moisture can really change the conductance level. So. Uh, and that is something uh, that we can mitigate by putting some capping layer on the top. Let's say, for example, we put some alumina layer uh, and prevent uh, and do some kind of an annealing in order to get rid of as much of the moisture or water vapor as possible, make it more reliable. Uh, but as you, you know that, you know, the trapping, detrapping also has some other issues, so, uh, which is the endurance, how many times you can cycle. Uh, that's a problem with the NAND flash memories. You can hardly do 10 to the power 6. In our lab, we have been able to go up to, I think, 10 to the power 4 or 10 to the power 5. Uh, we are trying to continuously improve that. Uh, but the idea that I am trying to present over here is that even if you do some other form of memory, uh, along with your MOS2, you should be able to do similar kind of computation. So, But your question is absolutely uh, right, uh, that we are taking care of charge trapping and detrapping. But any other form of memory will be equally uh, suitable for this application. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Participants, uh, anyone? Yeah. Okay, sir. We have a uh, few questions in our chat box also. Sure. Uh, Sir, Darshika is asking uh, whether it will be helpful for us if you, okay, sorry, sir. Uh, Narind is asking uh, for in-memory computing, what is the sufficient memory size for edge AI applications like autonomous car? That's an excellent question. I think uh, it depends on the application itself. Uh, autonomous cars really have to uh, possess a lot of information, right? So I think, uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, challenge with the autonomous vehicle is that right now uh, they have to essentially transfer all this information to the uh, cloud in order to do the processing. Uh, and that takes a huge amount of energy. So what we are trying to do, we are essentially trying to uh, bring the memory right next to the compute, you know, the in-memory compute. Uh, it is very difficult for me to give you a number, you know, what is the amount of memory that I need, you know, whether it's going to be 10 GB or 10 TB, uh, it really depends upon the application and the task that we are trying to uh, kind of do. I mean, my honest belief is that it will not be possible to completely do everything at the edge. We'll probably have to essentially do both things at the edge as well as using the cloud. Uh, uh, there is no way that we can really get rid of these servers because they have tremendous processing power and the memory. Uh, but what we are looking into is, let's say, for example, if I have a drone which is going to monitor the agricultural field, let's say, for example, uh, then these are essentially very, very resource constrained. You know, if I'm going to put some devices in a forest uh, which is going to monitor for forest fires, uh, uh, then my information uh, processing doesn't request to be very extensive because I simply need to notify the forest uh, uh, you know, authority uh, that if there is a fire that is starting. Uh, 
so we are looking into applications which are much more resource constrained. If you have resources, use those resources. Uh, try to make it energy efficient. But when we do not have resources, then I think we may have to rediscover some of these uh, uh, devices for in-memory computing and sensing, uh, which can be really low energy. Uh, so I don't know whether I gave uh, the answer to her question. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, and I do not really know the amount of memory that you need for each particular application. But the idea is that you have to kind of create a balance between the two, uh, in-memory compute versus cloud computing. Uh, depending on the application. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, Rohit Kumar Gautam is asking, sir, how exactly we stimulate the device to forget something? Right. So I think in this particular case, uh, what we are doing is we are always applying a uh, programming, electrical programming. So our device gets potentiated by optical uh, stimulus when there is light to the device. And in the back, we always are actually applying some electrical potentiation uh, or electrical depression rather than. Uh, so that is always happening. You know, I mean, and, and in, in fact, even in the human brain, that process always goes on. You know, I mean, neurons typically keeps making new connections and, uh, you know, kind of retract from previous connection. So here, what we are trying to do is that we're using the optical stimulus for the potentiation and we're using the electrical stimulus to the device for the depression. Uh, and we can change the magnitude of that electrical stimulus to figure out whether I want to essentially depress faster or slower. So my forgetting rate can be changed because I have a control over the electrical bias or the magnitude of the electrical potential that I'm applying. While the optical information that is coming is from the external sources. So, so that is how we are essentially trying to balance the two and make sure that our device can learn, forget, and relearn. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, Gaurav Verma is asking how to move from device to application framework for some novel device as you have discussed. Right. So I think that's an excellent question again. And I feel like at this point of time, what we are trying to do is mostly prototype development, uh, where we are showing that, you know, uh, a specific task like collision avoidance or a navigational task can be performed by these devices. Uh, in fact, in our group now, uh, as I have shown in one of those slides, that we are moving from just a few device level demonstration or a, a small scale integration to medium, large, and very large scale integration by uh, making not tens or hundreds of transistors, but go, going to almost like 10,000 or 100,000 transistors. Uh, and that is probably going to take place over the course of next uh, uh, couple of years or three years, four years, uh, whatever time it takes. And then beyond that point, I think uh, there will be startup companies. I mean, there are lots of startup companies which are already coming up. Uh, and there is a possibility of us partnering with them and then transitioning this technology from lab to fab. Uh, and that is when it's going to come out in the real world and we can start seeing some real uh, application of these uh, 2D-based sensors. Uh, in fact, you will see that you know TSMC has already put 2D materials in their roadmap, which means that they're also kind of thinking uh, along these lines. Uh, in fact, there are papers which just came out uh, uh, a couple of weeks back from Intel, uh, where they looked into MOSP and WSU-based uh, uh, NMOS and PMOS transistors. I was very happily surprised that even Intel is working on these things. So these things are going on even in the industry. Uh, and what we are trying to do is we are trying to show the different potential uh, so that the industry or the startup companies can take it up uh, and uh, push it even further. You know, in academia, we have limited scope. We will do our best uh, to kind of take it to TRL level three, four, and even maybe five. But beyond that, it is uh, really uh, the industries that have to come in. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, S. Srinivasan is asking whether uh, it is stable with humidity and temperature changes. Right, that's an excellent question. Uh, so I can say that for, for the temperature, uh, we have really looked into uh, uh, typical temperature ranges that an integrated circuit will be working on, uh, let's say from minus 25 degrees centigrade to 100 degrees centigrade. Uh, there you will probably not see a lot of uh, changes in the performance. Again, it depends upon the application. Uh, uh, so temperature wise, uh, the devices are uh, quite stable. Uh, in fact, MOS2 will be stable even up to like 200 degrees centigrade. And if you cool it down, uh, I mean, the problem of, I mean, the, the challenges are even less. So. 
Uh, humidity uh, will be a problem if the devices are not capped. Uh, but once you package these devices, which eventually will happen for any integrated circuit, uh, the problem of humidity will not be there uh, uh, because you will be able to make the interfaces very pristine without having any problem of you know moisture or water vapor being captured, like, like I was explaining earlier. Uh, so so uh, humidity problem can be easily resolved by packaging, uh, and the temperature uh, is not really a problem for these two devices. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, is it also radiation tolerant? Yes, I think we have also a lot of work uh, uh, that we have done in the past. We have uh, uh, one paper on uh, radiation uh, resilient of this 2D material. And the fact is very obvious that these 2D materials are very, very thin, you know, and something which is very thin is being seen by not, uh, nothing, right? I mean, so even if we expose it to very large doses of radiation, we have done it, done experiments with uh, alpha particles, and we have shown that even the doses uh, uh, that you will experience in the uh, uh, in the different orbits of Earth, you know, is really uh, minuscule changes to the device characteristics. So, uh, in fact, we have a project with the Defense Trade Reduction Agency where we are actually looking into gamma radiation effect of this 2D material as well. Uh, and I can tell you that our initial uh, uh, results show that these materials are really tolerant to radiation because they are very thin. Uh, it's just that it's very thin. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir Sandeep Nima is asking, how do we incorporate these novel devices with the current von Neumann architectures? Right. I think you can always integrate them with the von Neumann architecture. So von Neumann architecture simply means that you will have, uh, uh, you know, your normal CPUs and GPUs and TPUs, right? And then, uh, uh, and these devices could be used as peripheral sensors with some smart processing power, right? Like in the uh, in the past. Uh, people have really integrated, you know, FPGAs uh, or, uh, you know, ASIC uh, uh, with, uh, you know, normal CPUs and GPUs. So you can do it in a similar way. Uh, just the fact that we have now more capabilities at the sensing uh, stage to do some processing over there. Uh, in fact, that is the ultimate goal, right? I mean, we will essentially be able to process some information at the edge. Uh, and then the bulk of the, or the difficult or sophisticated computation still has to be performed by the cloud. Uh, and the cloud is still going to work on the von Neumann operation, uh, right? The arithmetic and the logic are going to remain separate over there. Nobody is going to bring those two things together. Uh, but in the edge, uh, we really need to bring these things together to do some smart processing uh, of the data at the sensor node. Uh, and that's all also good to a certain extent for some of the security application, which I have not been able to talk about in this, in this talk. We also work on the security. Uh, given that there is so much of information about our healthcare, our personal data, uh, you may want to essentially do the security uh, on your edge devices rather than you know sending all your information to the cloud and then getting encrypted from the cloud and then getting sent to wherever uh, the receiver is. Uh, uh, so and, and these devices also gives us this ability to secure the information. Uh, where uh, at, the, at, the, at the sender's end, rather than being uh, uh, sent it to some Google uh, uh, cloud, uh, where Google have access to all your personal information and then they encrypt and then they send it to your receiver, right? So you want to do that at the edge as well. Thank you, sir. And so the last question is from Gaurav Verma. Are the interfaces conventional CMOS based or designed as per the application? So, uh, uh, well, I want to understand a little bit about the interface. I mean, there are different, by interface, I typically uh, uh, would mean that the readout circuitry, right? So the readout circuitry is going to be very similar to CMOS because uh, at the end of the day, we are still talking about field effect transistors. Uh, uh, we are still going to make some inverters, AND gates, NAND gates, you know, current mirrors, op amps, uh, using this 2D material. The only difference now that all of these are programmable. Uh, so, so all the interfaces are simply going to remain very much the same. Uh, the only thing that is going to differ is that my arithmetic core and my uh, uh, memory are right next to each other. Uh, so, so I think if that's what you mean by in the interface, the interface uh, is going to remain uh, very much the same. I think you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saptashi Das, uh, sir, for this enlightening and very Saptashi, exciting session. Uh, 
Okay. Hi, Shaptashi. This is Jishnu yes. again. I have a little question. Yes, Jishnu. Yes, Jishnu. Yeah. Yeah. So, as an experimentalist, what do you prefer as an uh, encoding uh, architecture? It will be RAID-based or spike timing-based? Which architecture you will personally prefer as you have done many experiments? Yeah, I think uh, uh, you're absolutely right. I think uh, spike-based encoding is probably going to be the most useful going forward uh, because I can really encode my information by sparse coding uh, and that is what we are trying to do as well uh, it is not always very easy uh, you know in experimentally uh, to achieve sparse encoding is tricky i mean we have been able to do some of it uh, but not all of it yet uh, maybe some of our future papers are along these directions uh, but yeah spike encoding is probably going to be the way to go forward okay Thank you, participants. Thank you, everyone. Um, I would like to thank you, Dr. Saptishi Das, for uh, this very enlightening and very exciting session on the smart sensors and computing devices for hardware artificial intelligence. Uh, we are very grateful for the time and the effort you took to share your thoughts and your experiences with our uh, IEEE NTC community at IIT Indore. And uh, we, I, I would also like to thank all the participants for joining us for this very exciting session. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. It was great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Meanwhile, I would also like to thank our sponsors for this event. Hyper Vacuum, Gigatech Corporation, Excel Instruments, Rudraksh Technologies, Optimize Solution, Streamline, and Mansa Vacuum Technologies. Thank you. Thank you, participants. We'll see you in our next uh, series of talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Can we get a recording of this lecture? For the recording, please refer to our uh, YouTube video channel. YouTube, YouTube channel. So what's the channel name? Uh, uh, channel name? IEEE NTC IIT Indore. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.